Hi, this is Pete from Eurovercy. My guest today started his musical career in 1951 when his mum sent him off to piano lessons. He soon changed his mind, taking up the, the guitar, using an amplifier that his dad had built for him, and inspired by his musical idol, Lonnie Donahan, set about performing in bands. He was touring the country in a van covered in the lipstick of adoring fans while spending his days working in a corset factory. He continued to play in bands into the 70s when he joined the vocal group Guys and Dolls, achieving success in the UK and in Holland. Through his career, he's met Eric Clapton, Pink Floyd, George Harrison, Frank Sinatra, Paul McCartney, and most importantly, Bruce Forsyth. Eurovision-wise, he took part in the Abandoned Song for Europe of 1979, and he wrote and performed in the 1986 final with the song I'm Sorry, written for singer Chad Brown. Musician, singer, writer, publisher, and most importantly, Liverpool fan, it's my pleasure to introduce and meet Paul Griggs. Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. Good, good to hear from you. So I read your book, Diary of a Musician, to get a feel for your sort of career prior to Eurovision. And there's a lot of interesting stories about playing in bands and, and touring and, and gigging, and a lot of talk about guitars and the, the various different guitars that you've owned. How did you go from 10 to 15 years of playing in rock and roll bands and guitar to, to a mid-70s vocal group? That's a very good question. I had a band called Octopus, and we broke up in 1972. I'd been professional from 1967 to 72. And at 72, we decided we'd call it a day, after which I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, no idea at all. And for two years, I sort of bumbled about. I, could, I suppose to phrase John Lennon, it was my lost, lost weekend for two years. I was able to sing and play guitar, so I was able to do gigs acoustically. I was going for auditions for anything that came up in the music papers. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll give you an example, a couple of examples. I actually went for a, uh, an audition with UFO, who were a heavy metal band. Didn't get that, was out of my depth a little bit in that. Um, I was also offered a job in Mud, um, because Mud, had, we'd been really good mates before they, uh, in, the, in the octopus days, we were very good mates. And we used to, used to hang out with them quite a lot. And Dave Mount, the drummer, came around for dinner one day, asked me to join and um, believe it or not, I said no, which I, to this day, um, I don't understand. But then this, this job came up, uh, three boys and three girls wanted for a major project. Um, I'll tell you very quickly about the boys because I was 29 going on 30. I was a month away from my 30th birthday. And when they said boys, I thought I, I was sort of um, <laughs> overqualified. <laughs> um, so they sent me a form to fill in. Um, one of the questions was, what, how old are you? And instead of putting 29, I put 24, which I still thought was pushing it. So I lied about my age by five years. Um, cut a very long story short. Um, I got, had, an, had an audition, which I nearly didn't go to because I didn't really fancy the job. I didn't, didn't think it was something I really wanted because I was a, a so-called serious guitarist, musician. Uh, but I went for the job, I got it, and joined Guys and Dolls. And um, despite having problems with some of the music that we did, uh, not being totally um, liking a lot of it, I stayed for 11 years. And uh, that's about it. And during that time, um, Eurovision crossed my path. <laughs> you sort of touched on it briefly then, but how, how did it feel going from guitar and band heavy music to, to, to doing sort of vocal group songs? How did you adjust to that? And, and dancing as um, well? Yes, yeah, so that was, the, that was the, the main thing. When they, they, they actually said, I got the job, and we started rehearsals, and they said, um, uh, we don't need the guitar, you know, you've got to, you, and we're going to have a routine. Um, I nearly went apoplectic, I think, because um, uh, it's something I'd never done before. But I also had um, in the group Dominic, Dominic Grant, who, was the, um, who ended up doing a lot of the lead singing in Guys and Dolls, and he was a similar situation to me. He was, he'd come from bands. The other four had been stage school, so dance routines and movements, and such as they were, were easy to them. Hmm. But for Dominic and myself, it was um, it was not easy. It was a lot of hard work and sweat and toil. But how I just did, I, uh, I just, I don't know, I just went along with it. We, we got to know each other initially by going to each other's houses, um, hanging out, um, and I liked them all as people. And the rest, as I say, it's just a new new skill, if you like. But I mean, I can't say that any of our routines were particularly difficult uh, they were for me but uh, for, for the for the average dancer or dance trained person they weren't difficult but uh, i just adjusted to it but i did i did have a funny reaction from uh, 
a lot of my um, so-called heavy friends, uh, who some of them didn't want to know and some of them didn't, didn't want to talk to me. And I got, um, I, I, we had a following up in, um, in, in the Derbyshire area with, as Octopus. And I was getting um, communications then, what the hell are you doing? Why, why have you done this? You know, you're a great guitarist and you had a great band and what are you doing? And so it was a bit difficult. It was a bit difficult to, to, to adjust, but, but I did. I just did it. And it was, as I say, I stayed 11 years. So um, something must have been OK. One of the things you said in your book that I picked up on was um, the possibility that you could have a, a record which would not chart in the UK, but would then be number one in Holland, where you were also very well known. That's right. Um, and that's it's an almost Eurovision type question. But how what do you think the difference between the sort of the European audiences were and, and the UK audiences at the time as to why there was such a difference in attitude? It was very difficult, very difficult to explain that, man, because Holland, unless you sort of get immersed into the pop culture it's difficult to even put into words but they did like uh, the middle of the road stuff the, mm. the middle of the road and we did we did several covers well-known mm. covers we did angel of the morning we did and the song you're referring to is you're my world mm. which uh, Stella black had a number one i think it was number one hit here um and she didn't get arrested with it in holland uh, but we ended up in 1977 uh, being the best-selling single of, um, of the year in that in that country uh, but it's difficult to explain the situation out there. They, it's all sorts of strange scenes out there. There's a, once a year they have carnival season, where they have all these um, quite strange carnival records out. Um, and that's, um, if you, you listen to some of those, you'd be quite amazed, I think. Um, but it was, it was, I got used to it. I got used to it. I just adjusted to it. But um, it was difficult. But as I say, You're My World, uh, we released it here, didn't do anything at all here. But for some reason, it, it just clicked in Holland. Uh, we'd had we'd had hits, but not huge hit. Just went atmospheric, and uh, it almost it gave us a second career because we then moved out to Holland. Yeah. Uh, because the the scene over here for us had died down. We we'd lost our recording deal here. We weren't having hit records. Um, mm. And um, suddenly we had this huge hit in Holland, and we going over there becoming a Dutch group, which we did for five years. So. Um, how did the song for Europe come up for Guys and Dolls? How what was the process that led to to uh, Guys and Dolls getting getting shortlisted or deciding that they would take part? Well, well, it was towards the end. As I say, we weren't having hit records, and um, there were certain thoughts that um, Eurovision was a, a last resort for <laughs> for um, you know. Don't, I'm trying not to <laughs> deride Eurovision, but it was almost classed as a you know a. a an attempt to resurrect a career. Mm. Uh, because the same year that um, we were in it as Guys and Dolls, there was the Nolans were in it as well, mm. uh, the same year. Um, and I re and Michael Levy, our boss, um, told us that he entered us for Eurovision and we were, and then he told us we were in the last 12, which means we were in the, in the, in the actual show, mm. the Song for Europe. Um, I was quite horrified. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to, I have to say it, I was quite horrified. Uh, the song we did was written by um, Ben Findlay and Mike Myers, um, which it was one of those I thought I was another ballad. But on reflection, today, with a different hat on, if you like, and, and a bit of wisdom, I suppose, I, it was a very good song. It, it was mm. a very good song. Um, it didn't make, didn't it didn't win the contest. It may have done if we'd have been seen. I don't know. I, I don't know. Was there any, because obviously the, the, the contest got abandoned, then we'll, we'll come to that in a moment, but was there any plan to, uh, apart from singing on stage, was there a plan to dance or to make any sort of show of it? Or No, it was just a ballad. It was, um, I think we just swayed. We did a lot of swaying, actually. We did a lot of swaying. We just swayed in that one. Um, it, wasn't so much, it wasn't so much a visual in those days, yeah. doing the song. Uh, the visuals came later. Uh, it's more recent. I don't know when it started, actually, in a big way. You probably know that more than I do, being <laughs> an aficionado of, um, of Eurovision. But um, uh, no, we just went on and, and to perform the song. But unfortunately, as you, as you know, the contest was called off. Let's move on to that then. What were your memories of the, of the contest being cancelled? Oh, quite vivid, actually. Um, rehearsing, uh, we, we went, it was being held. They were making a big splash of the song for Europe that year because it was at the Alba Hall which was quite unusual. And um, we'd rehearsed in the BBC rehearsal studios at Acton for one day. 
And then the following day we went into uh, the Albert Hall and we spent all day, went there early rehearsing. And we spent all day rehearsing, all the acts were there rehearsing. Um, 12 acts, if I remember rightly, mm-hmm. uh, acts that year. And we spent all day rehearsing. And then it got to five, when everybody was sitting around waiting and we suddenly groups of people in huddles on the stage. And we realised something was, was not as it should be. Um, and we just sat there and sat there. Nobody said anything to us until, a six, I think it was at six o'clock, uh, when they, they announced it. There had been a, an industrial dispute. Nobody did actually find out what it was. Some backstage industrial dispute. And the technicians had gone on strike. So the contest, which was two hours away from going out live, this was six o'clock on the, on the day, yeah. the contest was, was to be cancelled. Um, we didn't know what was happening then. Uh, there was a bit of a gap. And then they said, we did, what we've decided to do is we're going to just carry on with the contest with the, the songs mm-hmm. to the regional panels, but just play the records to them and um, they'll judge on the records. It was actually pandemonium at the festival hall because by six o'clock, people had started coming in. There was 4,000 people um, um, coming in for an audience, including all of us. We had, um, I had my wife coming and my mum and dad, and we all had relatives there coming. And it was absolute bedlam as we all tried to find them uh, in the crowd outside, um, which eventually we did. Um, it was a lot of confusion, what we were going to do. But in the end, we decided we would go back to Magnet Records and wait there for the result. We went back to, to Magnet Records and he, got, he laid on champagne. He was convinced we were going to win, <laughs> as all bosses are, as all bosses do. And uh, we waited and waited. We were drinking and having food and it was having a good time. And at nine o'clock, they announced that um, uh, the winner was uh, Black Lace. Mm. Is that right? And I can't that's right, remember yep. the, name. the name of the song was, was Susan. Marianne. Marianne. Marianne, that's right. Black Lace with Marianne was the winner. Mm. Um, which, by which, uh, at that moment, almost immediately, the atmosphere changed. Everybody was depressed. So it was, that was it. And that was, that, was, that was the way the contest was done. We didn't see anything of how it was done. It was just done. BBC did it um, with the panels, they voted, and that was it. So very disappointing. I was surprised how disappointed I was, Reggie, really, because I wasn't really into it. But uh, when you get into the thing, I mean, you want, you, you want to win it, you know. You want, you want yeah. win it. And of course, as I say, um, the other group that was in it was the Nolans. Mm. And there's Harry, my Honolulu lover. Is it? That's that, the one. That, yep. that, yes. How about that? Where did that <laughs> come from? Goodness me. Harry, my Honolulu lover. Yes. And- and, and black so that lace was, that, that, was point, the, that was the contest. Sorry. And, and and black lace at that point were at a very early point in their career, weren't they? This was long before their sort of That's Agadoo right. days. That's were right. There any, were there any other artists that you were, that you knew of from the competition or? No, didn't know. They're all unknowns. From memory, I've got to feel Roger Whittaker was there, but it was a, it was a good song. How do you mend a broken heart? Um, it was a ballad, as I say. I was a it had a bit of balance in those days, but uh, yeah. on reflection, it's not a bad, it's not a bad song. Like so it. It, 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 what was it made it worse is when we actually had, you liked it. No, uh, what made it worse is when we actually had the results of the of the twelve records. We we came tenth out of twelve, mm. which was even more disappointing. You know, yeah. it might have been better. If, it might have made a difference if we'd been seen. I don't know because you know was, we weren't known. Mm. But um, that was it, and that was the end of. Um, Eurovision, 1980, uh, 1979, wasn't it? 79, wasn't it? 79, yeah. Yeah. Did the song form part of your performing repertoire or did you sort of abandon it straight away? Or... We did sing it uh, for a while, but then what happened is, on the strength of You're My World, it was, hit, it was a hit in Holland. I did mm-hmm. nothing over here at all. It was released here, but it was, a, it was a hit in Holland. I can't remember exactly how big a hit it was, but it, it was enough to make a, an impact in Holland. So we were... We were performing it. Um, we hadn't. Uh, we actually hadn't become. We hadn't gone over to Holland by this that time. But, mm-hmm. um, um, so it didn't feature in our act. I think we did it live because over here we had a band and everything. We might. I think we did it live um, for a while. But because nobody knew it, it was we probably dropped it quite quickly. Yeah. Fast forward six years now. So by 1985, Guys and Dolls were coming to an end uh, in the December of 1985. And your book says that by that point, you'd been told that you'd been shortlisted for the Song for Europe in 1986. What was the process of going from 
penning I'm Sorry to it than getting into the song for Europe. A little bit misty because I can't remember why I recorded it in the first place. I'm, I'm sorry. I, it's okay. um, I, had the, I had the song, like, Dominic liked it. Really, um, it wasn't a sort of song, although I, I can sing a lot of my songs, it was a song for me. It was a ballad once again. I wrote a ballad. Hmm. But it was sort of a more of a rock ballad, I'd say, in a way. It didn't really suit me, and, I, and it suited Dominic. I mean, it's a rough demo, and I got a feeling that a guy called Martin Percy heard it and liked it, and he said, I'm going to enter this for Euro, I'm going to enter Eurovision, but we've got to do a proper version of it. So he went in and recorded a version of it with, um, um, well, I, because I used to do a lot of, I think I did all the backing myself, really, apart from the uh, keyboards. We had a, our keyboard player did it in, in, from the band. And... Um, we went and recorded a proper version of it, which is the version that you you know of, you've you've heard, and um, we put it in. We put it in. For, he put it in for Eurovision, and lo and behold, round about December, uh, just as Guys and Dolls was finishing, I heard I was in um, in the in the in the last eight. Mm. I think it was eight. Was it ten? I can't remember. It was eight. Yeah, it was eight, and mm -hmm. um, which is all quite exciting, considering my feelings about Eurovision. I suddenly thought, oh, this Eurovision is all right, isn't it? It's not bad, actually. It's, it's, yeah. Being a bit hypocritical, you know. It's, so when, when Martin Percy said he was going to put it forward, what was your was your feeling, oh, no, not again? Or was it just, just see what happens? Or... Well, I just thought, see, I thought to me it wasn't a Eurovision song. I, I, I thought it was an OK song. Um, Dominic really liked it. But I just didn't think it was right for Eurovision. But what, what is right for Eurovision? I mean, I don't, I don't think we know anymore, do we? Um, I, I think, well, I think that's, that's, things, that's an even broader question now. I think that it was in the eighties. Yes, probably was. Probably was then, and it didn't um, seem to me right. But, but I thought, well, you, you know, if you want to put it in, and you think it stands a chance, um, yeah, we'll go for it. I've got no problem with it at all. You know, so we put it in, and that was it. And, um, and, we, and, it, and we, we came down. It, it came down. You know, it's, I think they they tell you when it's in the last forty, then the last fifteen, and then they right. and I kept getting these messages. So it's moving up, it's moving up. And then eventually I was, um, had a phone call from Martin to say it was, uh, it was in, the, in the last last eight, Great. which was, it was very exciting. It was and also, yeah. at the end of Guys and Dolls, I thought at least it's something, you know, something else I can, I can work on, you know, in the future. Yeah, and I think in those days, the Music Publishers Association received between three and 400 entries a year. Yes. So to get the last yes. eight, always yes. a nice feeling. Oh, it was quite an achievement. I, I felt quite an achievement with it, and I thought, oh, but, People like it, so it must because you can't tell what when you write a song, you don't really know how good it is. You know, you mm. you, you think everything you write is the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know. <laughs> um, but it's it's not for you to say; it's for other people mm. to say. And um, it was a a light song. And you said it wasn't suitable to, for your voice, um, and Dominic wasn't available. How did you come across Chad Brown? Well, oh yes, um, unfortunately, I wanted Dominic wanted Dominic to sing it, uh, but he he got commitments in Holland. And he couldn't do it. They they formed a group called Grant and Forsyth, uh, and they were very busy in Holland, so he couldn't do it. So uh, Martin Percy found Chad Brown, um, a band called a Rock and Heart, um, and he came he came and sang it. And um, the only problem I had with him, he's got a great voice, but he was he, he did all the twiddly twiddly stuff. He, mm. he's, he's rather than singing the song, he tended to. Be one of these show-off singers. I mean, I, I tend to not like all these female singers that, that um, hover around the notes um, mm. rather than try and show off what they can do rather than sing a song. And Chad was a bit like that, mm. but uh, he sang it well enough. Um, but I still would rather have had Dominic doing it. You know, it was, yeah. To be honest, I'm just being honest now. Yeah. No. Did you know any of the artists? I mean, Vanity Fair had been around in the 60s and 70s, although I think the line was markedly different, but... I knew of them, you know, Hitcher. Hitcher and a Ride, I think, they were hit with. Um, but um, I can't remember any of the others in it at all. But um, we, we, uh, we had to do a, the preview on Wogan uh, mm -hmm. first, which uh, we had to sing it. And the rules, the rules in, in Eurovision, I, I think you know, that you're allowed six people um, mm. uh, to, to appear. So there was the four of us, Chad, and another singer who was singing off camera. Uh, Des Dyer. Des, Des Dyer, yes. 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 Another, another song for your entrance. Des Dyer. He, he, was singing, he was singing off camera because there was, was quite a lot of harmony, block harmonies on that song. Mm. Um, so he sang harmonies with me. I was singing 
Chad was singing. I think mm -hmm. our bass player was singing. Our, um, yeah, but the keyboard player was singing. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of harmonies there, and Des Dar was singing off, off camera. Yeah. So we did the Wogan show. Mm -hmm. Seemed to be all right, okay. But as I say, he, he still... He did try and do these acrobat vocal acrobatics in it, which yeah. tend to, um, that's not how I wrote it. I didn't <laughs> write it like that. Yeah. And then we did the Song of Europe, and um, my memories of that, I can't remember, it was at the television centre, which we knew well. And um, unfortunately, uh, the voting came on, and it was doing very badly. It was eight, it was eight out of eight, um, which is quite, which is quite, Realizing when you're sitting yes. there watching the votes. So at this point, the Wi-Fi failed, but Paul went on to say that after the final jury, the song came seventh out of eighth. So not satisfactory. Martin, he said, oh, don't worry, we're going to release it. We're still making a hit. But there was a thing, in, if you had a, a failed Eurovision song, that um, it was never going to be a hit. Yeah. Never, yeah. never happened. Mm. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't. So it got, it got um, the song got left... Um, nothing, nothing we did, nothing we did with it. I had the version of Dominic singing it. Yeah. Never did anything with it uh, until uh, this year. My son is a horror psychological film called Wolf Garden. It's coming out. Well, it's coming out in America in February. I'm not sure when it's coming out in England yet. So this is this is only. I'm probably not even supposed to tell you this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and but the thing is, he's. Sorry, because uh, I, I don't know you know Dominic sadly died yeah. two, years, two years ago. And he was my best buddy and he, all the way through, even, even to this day. And, hits, hits, and it hit the family hard because we were, the families were very close to get close. Yes. And as a tribute, uh, my son said, I want to put Sorry in as the closing credits. So the whole, oh. song, is, the whole song is on the closing credits of his film Wolfgang, you know. Well, like Dominic Singer as, as a tribute to Dominic, you know, which is, which is nice. I genuinely can't wait to hear that. <laughs> yeah. As, as a writer or, and, and performer, how much control did you have over staging, performance, costumes, those sorts of things? Or was it the BBC telling you what to do? Or I wasn't really... Uh, to be, uh, you're talking about now for sorry. Um, yeah. I can't remember. Martin, I think it was all down to us what we did. Mm. Uh, Martin went out and did some deals and got some dodgy, dodgy jumpers, <laughs> which we wore. If you've seen the video, you've probably seen them. But I, yeah. I, I ended up wearing it, but I couldn't stand the jumper, so I wore a jacket. It was just a performance. It was just the, the band there with Chad in front singing and us in the background. You know, it was just a yeah. pure band performance. No staging, no staging at all. And am, am I right in thinking that it was a backing track, so the guitar solo would have been mined? Yes. Yeah. Although how I, did that, how, what I did, were your feelings I did on that? I backing myself. Oh, I got so used to, to miming and not miming. I've done Top of the Pops with Guys and Dolls, and in, in some it was, uh, it depends on, I don't know if you know the rules in Top of the Pops. But, um, in yeah. our era, but there was a Top of the Pops orchestra that had to play Musicians' Union, that was, mm. uh, had to have used the musicians for one song. And because we were a vocal group, uh, it used to be us. So we used to sing long live, whatever we did. Mm. And then um, it got to the stage when uh, they stopped that idea, but we still had to. Oh, there's one funny, there's one funny top of the box we did for a song called Only Loving Does It, which was an, which was an OXO advert, which we did. But I played the solo on the record. Um, I'll tell you this little story, gone, uh, gone off the, tr the track a bit, but the story is that um, we had to play live, and I had to play live guitar solo. Now, on the record, I played the solo, and it was a double track. Uh, not a double track, it was a um, harmony. There were two parts, it was a harmony guitar part. And they'd written out the, the one part for the guy in the Top of the Pops orchestra to play with me. Now, there's a little wooden box with a speaker that used to be around and we had to hear, hear what was going on. I, that, the video's on, it's on YouTube somewhere, but I'm sitting there almost biting my lip trying to hear him, hear me, and play the guitar solo correctly because it was completely live. But if it was mined, I'd, I'd mind, you know. I've got some wonderful... Um, all the television shows we ever did, the whole of my mind. Mm. And um, I've got a, some, a, a couple of marvellous uh, clips of me playing the harmonica, which mm. I can't play. <laughs> I, well, I, can, I can vamp, you know, I can do a bit of blues, but there's I, 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 a, like a harmonica solo in it. And it makes me look as if I'm really playing it, but I'm not, you know, because I can't, <laughs> I can't play the harmonica. I didn't mind. I, I used, used, to do what, used to have to do what came up, you know, if you had to mind, you had to mind. 
and mm. um, on the sorry, on I'm sorry, yeah. I played the solo originally, so it wasn't no problem yeah. minding it. You know. <laughs> this may seem a bit a bit of an obscure question, but in in your book you talk about um, there's a quote where you said you, you did hardcore fans of Lonnie Donegan didn't like it when they didn't perform it as the record was intended. Um, now the song for Europe made use of an orchestra backstage and you have got some strings added in live, I think. Was that something you wanted or was that something some what, of the BBC did or on what oh was I'm sorry. On I'm sorry, there's a there's a sort of No, you, that's just yeah, purely what was on the track. That was our what keyboard playing. Yeah, there's no strings on there. That no, was okay. purely that was purely the six that was purely the six six of uh, five the five of us playing. Uh, we okay. and we went and did a specific we had to go and do a backing track again uh, okay. so we did actually do it again and that was us playing uh, but the strings right. are purely synth the keyboard playing strings oh okay, oh, okay. Um, sorry I, I thought that was the because there was an orchestra for some of the songs I don't know whether they helped you out with the backing track or uh, but no okay well I've, I've learned something <laughs> no I don't think they can actually I don't think you've got to have you, you're only going to have six people playing on the record I'm sure they get round that these days. I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, jiggery poker goes on these days, I should imagine. But there were six people and that was it, you know. Yeah. Okay. We, did, we had an orchestra. Now, hang on. Because Ronnie Hazelhurst was, was conducting the orchestra. I'll have to go and have a look again because I, you, you could be right. I, but I don't think it did. I don't think it didn't have an arrangement for the strings. But I should say, going back to the Guys and Dolls one in 86, uh, 80, was it 80, 70, 79. 70, 79. Mm -hmm. um, that was done with the orchestra, of course. That was, um, it was the six of us and the, and the orchestra. But one, we had one extra vocalist in that as well. It was such, such a long time ago. I, a lot of no. stuff I remember. Yeah. <laughs> and then two years later, your friend Julie Forsyth managed yes. to win the Super for Europe. Um, did you offer her any advice? I oh, wish she didn't need advice from me. You know, she's, it was fine. She, it was so great to see, you know, her get through. And it was so disappointing lose by one point he did mm. to Celine Dion yeah and was it um get the country was it Bulgaria or something you had no, no points it was Yugoslavia I can't remember it's in the book it was, it was Yugoslavia because, because Bruce went on oh Yugoslavia that's right yeah. because when Bruce when Bruce Forsyth went on um, room 101 mm. he put Yugoslavia in the in <laughs> one because because they didn't vote for Julie you know and, and neither did and neither did the Netherlands given her and Scott's popularity. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. And um, we've always, that was, that was um, a bit um, uh, political because mm -hmm. we were both uh, working in Holland solid during that time. And it was almost like a bit of sour grapes from the Dutch not voting for Scott, yeah. because Scott Fitzgerald was yeah. also working out there. That's how we got to know Scott. You know. Yeah. And he was working out there, and then they gave they, they gave nil nil point nil nil point. So so Scott's Scott's song is actually one of my favourite Eurovision songs, um, and I read in the book that you toured radio stations with him for a little bit. Yes, yeah. I was just at the time when I I, I was between jobs, and um, I think it was Martin Percy involved again, and he said, um, "Do you want to go around with Scott?" I said, "Yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great laugh. It'd be a great laugh." Played to Scotland. To Glasgow, started up up there, went, walked all the way all the way down the, the country, ending up in Bristol, and then coming home. I had, a, had a great laugh. It was about a week, wow. week or so. Good fun, great fun that was. Yeah, excellent. Did you submit any more, or did Martin submit any more songs on your behalf for you, or was that your your only foray into the into the song for Europe? Yeah, that was that was it. You know, I the last last time I did it first, um, first and last time I did it on my own. You know, I didn't didn't do any more. Hmm. Um, I went into another contest, which is probably a, the Buddy Holly Song Contest. Mm. And that was purely so I could meet Paul McCartney. You know? <laughs> I was I was going to ask because again in, in your book you mentioned that you you'd taken part in a Japanese song contest representing the Netherlands. You'd done the Buddy Holly Song Contest. You won a you won a talent contest where you won a hundred cigarettes. Um, I certainly in, did. Yeah, in your early career in, uh, in Butlins. What's your view of sort of? competitive music I don't know if that's the right word but sort of I mean obviously the charts are a competitive thing but actual judging and competing in the way that you did I know what you're saying I know what you're saying um I didn't really like I didn't really like that. when you're starting off going back to the the cigarettes I'm on cigarettes at Butlins um when you when you're starting off especially in those days don't forget I'm I'm very old uh so this was going back to 1960 59 60 61 somewhere somewhere around there 
um, you did sort of anything that came up, and this, you know, you see talent contests, and you think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going, oh yeah, I'll do that, you know. So that's what I did, um, and I think even with my group, my first group, we were called the Cortinas. I think we went, in, we won a, a, a local beat contest, as I recall in those days, a beat contest, yeah, St Albans beat contest, we won. Mm. Um, 25 quid and that, but over the years I just think it's, it's very difficult judging songs I, 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 I you know they're, they're so diverse yeah. they're so diverse songs mm. that uh, how can you it's just an opinion really isn't it I, mm. um, I'm not crazy about sorry it. I don't know that sorry that's my that's my Alexa that's <laughs> <you. laughs> shut up <laughs> um, yeah, no, we, we did we did the Yamaha one. Um, that was once again. That was that was pre. That was before we did Eurovision, wasn't it? It was just mm. a few months before we did. Eurovision. It was a lot of big names on it and things, and it was just a bit of a bit of fun, really. I think mm. we win um, a, a, a a good a, was it a favourite song? Or, uh, the, the the grand prize was won by Tina Charles. Mm. We won. A, there were all sorts of different prizes. We won a prize for. Mm. Um, best song, or, or which which it wasn't. It was a terrible song. One of the worst <laughs> songs we ever recorded. That one. It was awful. I was. It was. I had to say this. It was written by co-written by Pete Waterman. <laughs> um, but it wasn't. It wasn't good. I mean, you can hear that. That's on. The, that's on the uh, YouTube. But we did it. I'm going to ask a few quick fire questions now. If that's okay. okay. The first, yeah. The first, right. first one was: Do you watch Eurovision these days? Uh, yes. And what, what do you think of it? I usually sit there moaning, you know. <laughs> <laughs> occasionally, no, occasionally it turns out the song. I, I mean, I must admit, I did predict the result this year. Mm. Um, I thought, um, what's his name? I think, Sam, Sam Ryder. Um, yeah. I thought it was, a, it was a great song. And it hit me. As I listened on the radio before, before the contest. Mm. And it hit me. And I thought, that's a good song. And I actually put on my Facebook a few days before, I think Ukraine will win and Sam Ryder will come second. And that's true. You can see it. it's there for all to see. And I thought, because I, I thought Ukraine's going to win. They could have sung Three Blind Mice and they won it. But I thought that was a very, very good song, which I, mm. which I haven't really thought for years. Yeah. Uh, there was one that um, the Dutch one from about three or four years. Um, do, you, do you remember the song? Came second, I think, in Eurovision. The common limit. Three or four years. Yes, that's the one. Mm -hmm. I thought it was, I thought it was, I thought it was a good song. I, I yeah. liked it a lot. But it's, 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 I liked it. Shall we say I liked it? It's very difficult. It was a good song. Who would you like to see represent the UK? Oh, it's a terrible thing to say. Probably I'm probably not that bothered. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's difficult because you put in big names. Mm. And they usually flatten their faces. And uh, I don't think anybody you can you've done they've done it in the past with big names in big composers in. Um, and it's just not worked. And so I'm not sure that you know you could say put Paul McCartney in doing a song. It probably wouldn't work, you know, it'd probably still do very badly. Um, mm. so I don't really know. Who would you like to see? For the UK, I'd I'd like to see the return of a national final where Good singer songwriters are doing sort of sort of Goodness new music, and, and we're seeing more sort of the less Eurovision type songs turn up from other countries. Um, uh, sort of, there's been recent entries that have, from other countries that are doing really well on the charts um, from singer songwriters, and I'd like to see that rather than a big name. I think um, I think I've dodged that quite well. <laughs> yeah, you have. Yeah, very very well dodged. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think I did the um, same as well actually <laughs> <laughs> my final quick fire question then if you could pick an artist to cover I'm sorry who who would you want to do it oh it's so it'd be a rock singer mm. something like possibly Rod Stewart or Brian Adams or something like that you know? I mm. see it as a rock as a rock thing you know yeah yeah, yeah. no that's your Rod Stewart eh? he could do it as well it's his, it's his quite high range I can, yeah, I can imagine that. It's got one of those, one of those gravity voice singers, you know. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, that's everything I wanted to ask, unless you've got any other memories of your time from the song for Europe to, to share, but I think we've sort of covered no, a lot. No, I, I, I think I've covered everything. Because mm. I actually had, I've got my 
you talk about my book. I've got I've got my book here. <laughs> I've, been, I've been revising before the interview because I it's all in there. I often do yeah. that. My book is quite a good um, 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 I don't know document of my of my life as a musician. I yeah. often go back and check it because I did it. I kept you know the reason I wrote it in is because I kept diaries. And I've got a pretty good memory, but uh, 78, memory's not as good as it used to be. So I did yes. go back and, uh, and have a little look up thing. I, did bit, well, I looked up a few things on that, you know, hmm. on the Eurovision. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of, um, speaking of memories, you, know, you, you may yeah, not, yeah. You, I'm, I'm absolutely certain you, you won't remember this, but 12 years ago when I was a younger, sillier boy, I, I emailed you to ask if you had any sheet music for I'm Sorry. And good enough, you sent me a word document of all the lyrics and the chords uh, which i still have in my inbox oh really somewhere. yeah I, vague, I vaguely remember that yes um that, so, that was uh, quite an exercise for me actually because i didn't <laughs> remember the chords you know it's, yeah um yeah. And, and me and a mate um we were gonna it, we were in our final year at university and we were gonna sort of be abandoned obviously these things just never come by um but we, we did a couple of rehearsals where we tried to we tried to do it and Oh really? I absolutely butchered it. <laughs> oh right. It's not an easy song, as I say, because I, I basically it's the only song that I've written where I, which I really honestly can't, I can't sing it. You know, it's not. I've done a version, but uh, you know, I, I've got a version of me doing it somewhere, but it's, it's not. It, I mean, Dominic did it great. Dominic was good. Yeah. It's his, it was his sort of song, really his sort of song. But I, but I would like to hear Rod, Rod or, or Brian Adams do it. You know, it's, anybody. Oh. <laughs> It may be some money, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's the thing. But anyway, I hope, hopefully it'll, it'll be out in the film. And it's, a, it's a nice trip to Dominic. So it's, yeah. It's, 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 well, Paul, that's been absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you so much for your time this morning. You're, um, you're very, very welcome. You're very welcome. Thanks very much. Have All a great right, day. You take care.